It's March 4th, 1829, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Masses of ordinary Americans who feel excluded from power by the corrupt political elite descending on Washington to show their support for the tough-talking president they believe is the nation's hope. I don't want to put too fine a point on the comparison, but it isn't Donald (laughs) Trump. This is the inauguration of Andrew Jackson on this day in 1829, which ended in not, well, I don't think, we wouldn't call it a capital riot, but certainly a White House disturbance. A melee at the levee, I've seen it described as. I mean, Jackson himself was in quite a bad mood on his inauguration day, in part because he had attributed his wife's recent death to the abuse that she suffered at the hands of his political enemies throughout the presidential campaign. And he was actually planning to skip the evening's inaugural balls and wanted to keep the other ceremonies to an absolute minimum. So when he got to the Capitol, he delivered this really crisp speech and was sworn in by the Chief Justice John Marshall. But then right from that moment, as they then paraded from the Capitol down, to the White House, which was the tradition at the time, things really began to get out of hand almost immediately. But, and again, you don't want to make too many comparisons with Trump, because actually politically, in his era, he was more of a sort of Bernie Sanders on the political scale. But he had attracted this particular contingent of supporter to be down there. I mean, his whole persona was as a disruptor. He had no political experience before this. He was a soldier who'd made a name for himself commanding an army, with no formal training doing that either, by the way, but had defeated the British at New Orleans in 1812 and had really built up a following of basically white working-class men. And that was his base, to the exclusion of anyone else. And that was a break in tradition... Uh, because obviously everyone else was also appealing to white men, but usually wealthy white men, landowners, who saw Jackson as a bit oafish and underhand and rough. Not only had he had this mudslinging campaign against John Quincy Adams, but prior to this, he was known for getting into brawls. He once killed a man in a duel who'd Mm. slagged off his wife. Yeah, and I mean, if you think the world of politics is a kind of rarefied elite now, it was it was even more so at the time. And this election of 1828 was the first one in which the majority of non-property-owning white males could vote. So there was this whole new base to exploit, which gave Jackson this crucial chance to get the presidency, which really, and I mean... God, you want to stop making the Trump comparisons because it all seems a bit pat. (laughs) However, when he first ran for president in the previous election against uber elite John Quincy Adams, he actually won a plurality of the vote in both the Electoral College and the popular vote. And victory was snatched away because he didn't win an outright majority, because this was before the two-party system. You didn't have separate parties necessarily, you just had different factions. So you had multiple candidates running for president. And because he failed to win more than 50%, it went to a House of Representatives vote. And they decided to elect John Quincy Adams. And Jackson and his followers had a suspicion that this dirty deal had been struck behind the scenes to keep him out and keep him from his rightful place as president. They called this the corrupt bargain, which was literally his version of Stop the Count. Yeah, but that great unwashed that we're sort of talking about as being his electorate, it's actually the recollection of one woman in particular that makes people look back on this event as a moment in history where there was this sort of near brawl at the White House. And the the woman in question was Margaret Bayard Smith, who was a Washington socialite. And she wrote this letter to a friend that is the basis for quite a lot of what we know about the events. And what she wrote was that thousands and thousands of people without distinction or rank, exactly his base, collected in an immense mass around the Capitol. And she then describes the way that they walked down Pennsylvania Avenue, which was then unpaved. And there was kind of this, like, job seekers wanting to buttonhole him and other people wanting to get a look at him. And she says, countrymen, fire Farmers, gentlemen, mounted and dismounted, boys, women and children, blacks and whites, carriages, wagons, all pursuing him to the president's house. So really, already you get the flavour of this thing that she is trying to create, which is a sense that this was the sort of, you know, every single part of the, the broad plurality of the United States coming together, and many of them being the sort of unsavoury types who you don't want in the White House. Thank you very much. <laughs> Although at that point of the letter... 
she's still trying to create a, a positive image of this is democracy in action. You know, I don't support the guy, but look, everyone's turned up to see him. And basically, they just want to shake his hand. I mean, that's all they're doing. Right. They want to shake his hand and say, well done for being president. But three hours later, because she kind of goes away, doesn't she, the way mm, she tells yes. the story. She goes away from, from watching the inauguration because she can't get near him. Three hours later, she turns up to the White House and then it starts getting dark. She says, The majesty of the people had disappeared, and a rabble, a mob of boys, Negroes, women, children, scrambling, fighting, romping. What a pity, what a pity. No arrangements had been made. No police officers placed on duty. The whole house had been inundated by the rabble mob. And she's simultaneously trying to talk up the scariness of the crowd, isn't she? Yeah. At the same time, she's she talks down the numbers because she's not a supporter of Jackson. So she says, apparently there were 20,000 people there, but I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> so she is a slightly unreliable witness. Like, something like this definitely happened. Yeah. But she certainly has a perspective. I mean, the other person who wasn't there at this stage who missed that three-hour period was Jackson himself because he was so assailed by well-wishers that he had to climb out of a window and then just retreated to his hotel. Whether or not you believe her account is completely neutral, which it probably isn't, what we do know for sure is that the inauguration had drawn way more spectators than previous ones, which makes sense because he had such a nationwide appeal. People had made that journey to come and see him. In fact, it goes to show how removed the Washington political class was from the majority of people. If you look at the words of Daniel Webster, who was a senator at the time, and how puzzled he is, he he wrote... Persons have come 500 miles to see General Jackson and they really seem to think that the country is rescued from some dreadful danger. Mm. You know, they, they were completely clueless as to what this man's appeal was. He was so different from everybody else in power and he was attracting these kinds of people who had only just received the right to vote in a lot of cases and who a lot, a lot of the people who were already in Washington thought maybe shouldn't have received the right to vote. They actually... They used the word mob earlier. It's interesting because that's what they called it. They called it King Mob, these mm. people that he'd attracted. And they weren't just afraid of Jackson himself who had come to Washington. I mean, he didn't use Drain the Swamp. He compared it to mucking out a stable, but, hmm. you know, Same not deal. too dissimilar. Mm. But they were also afraid of these people that followed him and this cult of personality, which was something that was seen as quite new and frightening, that you had these people who were devotees of one specific politician and would follow him. But it's interesting, isn't it, from this kind of post-Trump perspective to, again, remember that he's coming at it from the relative left. I mean, yes, he was a slave owner and a slave trader. So by modern standards, certainly not. I mean, looking back on his career now, from a 21st century perspective, it's all quite alarming. He conducted what would now be seen as a genocide against Native Americans before he even got to office. And then afterwards, when the Supreme Court told him to stop decimating land that belonged to Cherokee Indians and reclaiming it for America, he just ignored them and steamrolled on through. Mm. This is his political record as we look at it now. But at the time, it must have been very exciting if you were a supporter of his. Yeah, and the central plank of his platform had been to wrest back power from Washington and reinvigorate democracy by removing the layers that were dividing the ordinary person from power. And some of his proposals were quite radical. He actually wanted to do away with the Electoral College, which is a debate that's still being had in America now, you know, 200 years later. Back to the party, though. Again, if you believe the uh, account that we receive via Bayard Smith, uh, the order was only actually restored by the quick thinking of the White House staff, who had the clever idea to push the alcoholic beverages that were being served out the window, which made the guests all follow. Um, so everyone then kind of made their way onto the lawns and they were like, phew, we can now count the cost of, uh, of what went on in here. And accounts even of the damage that was done do range wildly from a few broken glasses to the kind of oriental rugs being ruined and like guests smearing their muddy boots all over the sofas because they were standing on them trying to see Jackson himself and all of that sort of stuff. But actually, you know, nothing got burnt down. Yeah, I mean, if anything, you know, there are accounts of men coming out with nosebleeds and women fainting, but it does seem like the vast majority of the issues just came from the fact that there were thousands of people trying to get into the White House. It wasn't necessarily in a spirit of malevolence that any of this was going on. It was just people starting to see that there was a problem with having an open door policy at the White House, <laughs> especially on the day of the inauguration. Apparently White House staff reported that the carpet smelt of cheese for months after the party. <laughs> That's the truth of most of the parties that I throw. Well, astonishingly, they carried on with this open house tradition until 1885. You know, despite this experience, yeah. when Grover Cleveland opted instead to host a parade, so he yeah, could um, watch in safety from a grandstand and not have to get in touch with anyone's cheesy boots. <laughs> that said. 
President George H.W. Bush revived the idea in 1989 with a White House American welcome where they invited the public to the White House the day after his inauguration. I bet there were no bathtubs of whiskey then. Yeah, much less access all areas and no presidents getting pushed up against the wall and having to escape on their horse in that one. Next time... This seven-day week came into Rome through Greece, which in itself had taken it from the Babylonians. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.